Dave Lillick. Yes, sir. Come up here. Do you have that spinner? Yes. I got a box of them. So that's great. So, you know, I haven't done this in a while. <laughs> this one. Is it this way? Huh? It's okay. It's your show. No, no. Stay right there. I'm going to give it back to you. But, you know, it's, it look therapeutic. It is. So, I, you know, I haven't done this in a while. I've already been asked if I had PowerPoint, which I don't. <laughs> I've already been asked if I had the fill in the blank for the bulletin. No, I don't. So, I'm starting from behind. You're a minimalist. So, I probably picked a bad week to speak on anxiety. <laughs> but thank you for the therapy, Dave. I, I hope it's helping you. <clears throat> it was. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I chose to speak on anxiety. And I gotta change. It. I've never had this problem. It's been so long since I've done this. I had to figure out which glasses to wear. Does it look better? Does it look better? Which pair? Hmm? Yeah, it, it, it is something that the Lord has laid on my heart. Um, it's been an evolution of thought and, and contemplation and, and thinking about the role that anxiety plays in our lives. And, you know, if you look at it from a numbers perspective, uh, anxiety disorders are the most common mental illness in the United States. And according to uh, an organization that studies such things, Anxiety and Depression Association of America, 40 million Americans over the age of 18 suffer with some type of anxiety disorder. And if you start to roll that back even further, that's roughly about 18% of the nation's population. And you can break that down further, there's different types of anxiety disorders, but by and large, when you start looking at numbers like this, the, the statistics behind it show that anxiety has become the number one mental health issue in, in North America. And it's estimated that one third of the North American adult population is having is experiences health issues from that anxiety. And, you know, the studies show, and I'm sure we're all pretty familiar with the fact that anxiety impacts our body's ability to heal. It impedes our ability to learn. It limits our effectiveness in the jobs and it impacts our ability to care for our families. And anxiety, of course, is a complicating factor in dozens of other serious health problems, either directly or indirectly. Um, anxiety has a big impact on heart disease, asthma, diabetes, the list goes on and on. But when you start dealing with numbers of this magnitude, you begin to realize that anxiety issues hit pretty close to home for each of us. So many of us in this room right now are impacted in some form from anxiety. And Christians are obviously not immune to this plague of the modern world. I think, in fact, too many of us live with anxiety and treat it just like a normal part of our lives. Is that true for you? It makes you stop and, and genuinely consider the impact that anxiety has in every part of your day-to-day -day life. What is the impact of that anxiety in your home, in your workplace, or even in your ministry? 
you and I are beings created by God's careful and deliberate design. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, we have the means to achieve our God-designed potential. And that concept of God's design, that careful and deliberate design, is a theme that I want you to keep in the back of your head as we go through this. Because anxiety, at least in the form that we're talking, was never a part of God's design for who we are. So if anxiety seems like a normal part of your life, if you leave here today with nothing else, please know that anxiety was never a part of God's design for your life. We don't often think about it from this perspective, but one of the most debilitating aspects of anxiety and what makes anxiety even a ministry killer, from a, even speaking from a ministry perspective, is that anxiety by its very definition shifts our focus inward on ourselves. We become obsessively and almost exclusively introspective when we are plagued with issues of anxiety. And it's this incessant inward focus that robs of the others in our life of the attention, love, and ministry that they deserve. So we talked about a definition of anxiety. And I really had to kind of assemble one. <clears throat> but the, the, the definition of anxiety is the cumulative effects and behaviors associated with worry, nervousness, and stress an individual feels regarding an anticipated event or a pending outcome that will potentially negatively impact the individual. So you're just worried about stuff is the bottom line. You're thinking, you're anticipating, and worried about that negative outcome, whatever it is. And we could certainly talk through a myriad of examples but I think you have a pretty good handle on what that feels like and what that looks like in your life. I mean, and you know, the synonyms that go along with this are worry, stress, apprehension, uneasiness, um, all of those lovely types of things. <clears throat> Anxiety in its most basic form, however, is a part of our design it's that part of us that God designed into us that provides for a degree of anticipation that drives us to preparedness. It's our first line of defense in our physical survival in a physical world. So it's that fight or flight response, and I'm pretty sure you've heard that term, that prepares us to deal with a physical threat against our life. It gives us the ability to react and respond in a moment to protect ourselves, and it's the fight or flight response, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing. In a modern society, however, you know, real genuine threats against our being are minimal by comparison. But unfortunately, our innate fight or flight response still gets triggered when faced with stress. Our fight or flight response gets triggered, but for very different reasons in this modern world. And unfortunately, what plagues us is the fact that that fight or flight response gets triggered in much higher volumes. Turns out that our first world problems are getting the better of us. And chronic anxiety and anxiety disorders are the result. And that anxiety, to whatever degree and whatever form, can be debilitating. It's become too commonplace. We're allowing anxiety in our lives to take a foothold. And I think we really need to 
engage in enough introspection to see what it's doing in our life. So what is it about our modern existence and our so-called first world problems that drives us to these such elevated degrees of anxiety? So if we're not worried about when we'll get our next drink of water or we're not running from some hungry carnivore, what is it exactly that we're dealing with? What is it in our lives that is triggering that response? And I'll give you one word. And there's a bunch of different ways that we could go with, but I'm going to give you one word and one concept, and that's expectations. Expectations, expectations, expectations. Expectations are placed on us and put upon us in every aspect of our life. There's all these different structures and constructs in your life and in your reality, and each of them has a different set of expectations that are put upon you. And like I said, there's any number of directions we could go with, with, with respect to the sources of anxiety, but I really want to focus on that concept of expectations. It has been said that the greatest cause of anxiety is endless expectations. Ultimately, we are all creatures of obligation and conformity. We like to follow rules. We all want to live up to those expectations. We all want to live up to the expectations of our parents, of our teachers, of our jobs, our families, and even our church. The thought of not living up to those expectations at any level, I think for many of us, conjures up images of spectacular failure that will no doubt lead to certain doom and eternal disrepute. <laughs> the fear of losing a job. The fear of getting kicked out of college. Or the fear of that disapproving look from your teenage daughter. All these things become frightening, unthinkable outcomes that drives our anxiety. We are all faced with these endless expectations. And it's likely that they are the greatest source of our anxiety. Like I said, the expectations placed on us come in many forms, come from many forms many sources, and most of us are absolutely driven to live up to those expectations. And the irony is, in many cases, we are the source of those high expectations. Many of us are eternal perfectionists. Many of us are incurable people pleasers. Anyone in that category? Anyone? I know at least three people in the room right now that should be raising their hand. Anyone? <clears throat> you weren't one of the three, but I'll take it. <clears throat> but regardless of the expectation and regardless of the source, it's that anticipation of failure that triggers our fight or flight response. That fight or flight response is triggered in our bodies and our bodies can't distinguish between a failing grade on a final exam or the threat of a hungry carnivore. Just doesn't know the difference. The difference for us in modern context is that the anxiety that we have is typically left unresolved. And just the same way, our bodies release the same fight or flight levels of cortisol and adrenaline. That's that fight or flight response. But we typically don't get to respond in the intense physical ways that our bodies are prepared for. After all, it's usually considered impolite to 
beat a professor with a stick or <laughs> run screaming from the classroom. I, I know it's been done, but... <clears throat> But it's this heavy, repeated exposure to these processes that will, that ultimately takes that toll, that physical and emotional toll on our lives. So I want to shift gears on this topic. And I want us to see that <clears throat> God cares about this issue in your life. God cares about the anxiety in your life. And he addresses it head on in his word. And I say it this way because I suspect many of us all tend to want to own our anxiety. We want to own it and we want to keep it to ourselves. It's private, it's personal, and we want to own it. We want to keep it. And part of that owning it and it keep it is because, hey, as, as believers, we've been trained to be responsible, to take accountability for our actions. And all too often, our anxiety is, is the result of mistakes that we've made. So if it's a mistake that I made, well, I've got to own that. I've got to take responsibility for that. We feel that it's our burden and not God's, and so we keep it close hold. But what does God say on the topic? A great deal, in fact, and we could spend a lot of time in a lot of different passages. But you'll be excited to discover that the Apostle Paul has a passage that tells us exactly what we should and should not be anxious for. Paul has a passage that tells us exactly what we can and cannot worry about in our lives and harbor anxiety. So turn with me in your Bibles, not surprisingly, to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again it's, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Verse 6 is Paul's treatise on the topic. Be anxious for nothing. Well, that can't be nothing, right? <clears throat> nothing surely doesn't mean nothing. I, so, so, so Paul in the passage, and if you'll indulge my deliberately obtuse sense of humor here, must be introducing a new category of things that we should, should worry about. We'll call it the nothing category. So there must be something in the category. Be anxious for nothing. So we'll have to figure out what's in this category of things that we can worry about. And so first we'll turn to the source of all biblical truth behind all biblical truth and look at the Greek. <clears throat> and in the Greek, the word translated in most of your translations is either anxious or careful is the word medice. The entomology of the word is compound in nature and basically says not one thing. <laughs> huh. Wow. Be anxious for nothing. So the omnipotent God of the universe is telling you through the inspired words of the Apostle Paul what you should and should not worry about. And in the Greek, it's clear, not one thing. 
Not one thing. And take a moment and consider. These are not the meager platitudes of your next door neighbor who came over to counsel you in a time of crisis and said, it's okay, everything will work out, God has a plan. No. It sounds like a platitude, right? Eh, don't worry about anything. This is the omnipotent, omniscient God of the universe saying this to you. So, if you believe that the words here belong to the inerrant, infallible word of God written to us about us and this dispensation of grace, if you believe that this is God's word, be careful. Be careful that you're not guilty of ignoring or dismissing the words here in the passage as just another platitude. And trust me, I get it. It sounds like a platitude. <clears throat> So out of practice. <laughs> you know, and just my reaction to it is probably your reaction to it. You say, so wow, Dale. You take half the morning, confront us with the depths of our anxiety, <clears throat> our anxiety-driven pain in our lives, and the best you can come up with is Philippians 4 and don't worry about stuff. <laughs> Yep, cue the music, sermon over. <clears throat> I'll be shaking hands in the back. Go and worry no more. <laughs> and with that in mind, I want to be very clear. The goal is not for me to stand up here and preach to you that you should never, ever worry about anything or never, ever have anxiety about anything or tell you that stress is sin. That's not my goal. And I say this for two reasons. Number one, I'm not going to stand up here and pretend that I don't have anxiety or worry. I've got family and coworkers over here that will <laughs> tell on me. <clears throat> Number two, is I know that many of you will take this message to heart and you'll start worrying about the fact that you worry too much. <laughs> and that now I just gave you another expectation <clears throat> that you have to live up to. The goal this morning is that I want to encourage you to understand why. God uses these words in this passage as a part of his word. I want to send you on a path to understanding why. Why is it that God and his infinite, infallible, inspired word saw fit to use such absolute and unqualified language in this regard? And I assure you, we will not fully answer that question this morning. The goal, as I said, is to point you down the path. The goal is to give you a road map to answering that question for yourself. The goal is to shape and challenge your thinking about your faith, about your attitude, and about your actions. And to shape all those things based on a perspective of the eternal timeless nature of God's purpose and plan for our lives. The journey to understanding why God gives us this worry-free imperative. I like that, the worry-free imperative. <clears throat> is the journey to faith. It's the journey to genuine trust, to genuine peace, to genuine joy. All things that God intended for us and designed for us. Design, design, design. And I suspect that the journey will reveal that the harsh and unforgiving and often cruel aspects of a reality may not change. Those things won't change. 
but we will. Along the journey, you'll realize that the expectations placed upon you will not change, but you will. And while this bigger journey is yours, my simple goal this morning is to tell you, to tell you in heartfelt love that you can and should have the freedom to relax. Amen. <laughs> that you can and should have the freedom to relax in your faith, in your Christian walk. The last source of our anxiety, the last source of high expectations and all these different things should be our faith. I did it. <laughs> should have gone with the lapel mic. Uh. It is. It, this is. This is really on my heart. I, I want you to know. I want you to start thinking about it in those terms. That you can and should relax. It's okay. It's more than okay. God wants you. God's command you. God's designed you to relax and rest in Him, and have no worries and no anxiety. I say those words. It's hard for me to comprehend them. But they're here, and so I trust them and I believe them first. In fact, I want to shape your thinking a little bit more and challenge you in this space. <clears throat> Answering this question, why did God write the worry-free imperative in Philippians 4, 6? Answering that question, Answering this question should become a new way of thinking about and embracing your spiritual growth. Answering this question should be a new way of thinking about and challenging yourself and monitoring yourself and measuring yourself along your spiritual walk. Because each step that you take towards understanding this imperative and embracing it in its full superlative glory is a step towards living the life of victory, liberty, peace, and joy that God intends for us and designed for us to live. Each step that you take is a step towards achieving that type of spiritual maturity that Paul in the previous passage in Philippians 3 describes as a degree of spiritual maturity that he considered the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We read those words all the time. When you look at them in context and think about them, man, this is where we should end up. There's a reason why God said this to us. And it wasn't to place another expectation on us. And growing from this and, and embracing this journey in this form I think what you'll find is that your ability to manage and overcome anxiety and stress in your life is your capacity to properly interpret the events of your life in the light of God's eternal and timeless grace and love for us. Implicit in all this is that we begin to understand that we begin to let it sink in that we are the result of God's careful and deliberate design. He built us with a purpose. He gave us a specific design and understanding that design and heeding the words of our designer is paramount to the whole process. As you embark on this journey and figuring out why God gives us this imperative, you should know that the verses that follow in our Philippians 4 passage 
provide a roadmap for that journey. And I went, as you read these words, and we kind of uh, deconstruct this a little bit in Philippians chapter 4, I want you to keep in mind that he designed us. And that God knows what's best for us. So look in your Bibles, um, back at the passage in verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Now, just as we discovered with nothing, we have another superlative in the form of everything. Paul, in his inspired words, tells us, be careful for nothing but in everything. So it's the same unqualified type of assertion. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. So in this end state, we're exchanging one thing for another, right? Anxiety, worry, stress for prayer, supplication, thanksgiving. And with that type of superlative use of the language here, I think the practical outcome for us is that when we pray, that when we go to God and we talk to God, we don't have to filter. Everything. Everything. Pray about everything. And I know that there's, depending on where you're at and who you're talking to, on theological, scriptural issues. You know, I remember a time when, <clears throat> you know, folks were saying, well, you should pray about spiritual things only. Right? You should only pray about this. You should only pray about that. Yeah. No, the language is clear here. Pray about everything. Let your requests, let all your requests be made known unto God. Again, what are we talking about? We're talking about this roadmap. God's giving us a roadmap to understanding why it is that he would tell us in such unqualified and deliberate language that we shouldn't worry about anything. Be careful, be anxious for nothing. This is a part of that roadmap. The other key point, he uses the language with thanksgiving. There's a bunch of different treatments for this concept in this passage. But I want to take a different twist. I think this is important. I think thanksgiving is important. Because every thank you that we give to God is an acknowledgement. Every thank you that we give to God is further revelation of our identity in Christ and our design in Christ. Actively acknowledging what God provides for us, actively acknowledging what God brings and what we don't bring is, all, is the ultimate insight into who we are in Christ and how we're designed. So I think it's good to think about it just that way. Verse 7. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So verse 7 is what God does for us when we trust and understand and follow through with the instructions given to us in verse 6. It's the end state. It's the outcome of responding in faith to God's word given to us in verse 6. And it's important to know what the passage does not say. The passage does not say let your request be made known unto God and all will be given to you. Or, let your request be made known unto God and God will remove 
all the expectations and stressors in your life. It doesn't say that. What does it say that we get? We get peace. We get incomprehensible peace. That's the outcome. Our circumstances don't change. We change. And it's the kind of peace that in context of the passage that literally protects our hearts and our minds. Right? That's what it says. Protects our hearts and our minds. And we've been talking about and touching upon this theme of design. So you and I are the result of God's careful and deliberate design. He created us in his own image. And being created in God's own image, we are created as a trichotomy. Just as God is a trinity, God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, we are <clears throat> mind, body, and soul. It's the essentials of our spiritual anatomy. And so what the passage tells us is that he's protecting that we have this peace that literally protects our hearts and minds. So this promise covers the two most important, and that process is empowered by the Holy Spirit. So he designed us, he understands how we're built, and like the master physician, he's giving us a prescription for sustaining us and giving us true peace. But there's more to the prescription. Look in verse 8. <clears throat> Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, <clears throat> whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. To me, this is fascinating. To me, this is just the height and the pinnacle of what God's trying to teach us in Philippians, what God's trying to address in us. And look, I'm just going to come out and say this. Paul's instructions here, the verse 8 instructions here constitute nothing short of a treatise on the power of positive thinking. Right? And I'm not advocating for some fluffy PMA type of philosophy or anything like that. But the words here are clear. And the message, again, represents another component of God's prescription for believers in their journey to finding freedom from anxiety and truly embracing God's grace and the peace that that brings. Focus, meditate, think on these things. Whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, things that are of good report, virtue, praise. Think on these things, not just platitudes, not just something nice to think about in this passage. The words here are deliberate, the words here are purposeful. Because God designed us, God created us, and he knows what we need to do. He knows how to empower the Holy Spirit within us. And if you look at the verb in the passage, think on these things, the think in terms of our spiritual anatomy and our overall design goes to that mind. It's the mind that thinks. So in body, soul, and spirit, where the spirit is the mind, Paul's saying, use your mind, use your spirit, and think on these things. And as I read through this, I was immediately reminded of, of, of Romans 12.1. And you don't have to turn there, but familiar passage. Paul in Romans talking 
It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So the mind is the mechanism that God uses for our transformation. The mind is the mechanism that God uses to allow the fruits of the Holy Spirit to be fed and grown and revealed. And so when Paul in Philippians 4.8 says, think on these things, and he gives us this list of positive things, he did it for a reason. You may not have to fully understand it. You just have to believe it and trust it. When I go to my doctor, I don't understand half the things he tells me, right? I, the whys. I just know, okay, I want to take that blue pill in the morning. I'm going to take the green pill at night, right? <clears throat> because I trust him. I may not understand what those pills do or why exercise helps blood pressure. I don't understand it, but I trust it because he knows more than me. And so I do what he says. And that's the purpose here. Do what he says. It's a prescription. It's a roadmap. In a series of studies between 1998 and 2009, researchers documented the impacts of positive reflection, thought, and gratitude in patients suffering from a variety of anxiety-related disorders. The results were remarkable. The results were in line with what God, through the words of the Apostle Paul, are telling us here. These studies were done absent any biblical worldview, but effectively aligned with the conclusions here. And there's, if, if you want to do the research and you want to do the study, there's proof that the positive reflection, and specifically what I found most interesting was the aspect of gratitude with thanksgiving. At the impact that that has on the human brain. It physically changes the human brain. <clears throat> Interesting stuff, but ultimately a matter of faith. Verse 9, the roadmap continues. What are we talking about? We're talking about this journey to understanding why God gives us this worry-free imperative. It's a journey that each of us have to take to understand the why. And in verse 9, Paul says, Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. The Apostle Paul, he's our apostle for today. He's our apostle for the dispensation of grace. God gave him the revelation of the ministry and the gospel. He is our apostle. And we need a role model in all this. Right? We need a human, fallible role model, and we have that in the Apostle Paul. So study and understand the life, the ministry, the suffering, and the grace of the Apostle Paul. His life reads like a master class on the topic. That's all I'm going to say about that. Paul goes on and he addresses the um, Philippians specifically for the ministry that they had done for him. And he qualifies his statements in verse 11 and says, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. And he goes on further to say, whether I'm full or whether I'm abased, whether I'm on top or bottom, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. 
There's a lot of different directions we can go with this. But the one thing that I want you to focus on is that Paul had to learn. It's a learning process. Learning requires patience, as the teachers in the room can attest to. <laughs> attest to. Learning and growing requires patience. It requires patience with yourself. I taught Sunday school class uh, a couple years ago, and I brought into the classroom a philodendron, and I set it at the back of the room. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, for the semester long class or whatever, we kind of measured the growth of the various pieces of the plant. You know, and as you look at the plant, we call him Phil, of course, um, <clears throat> you couldn't sit there and look at the plant and see it grow. Right? You could stare at it all day long and you couldn't see it grow. <clears throat> but, you know, if we made a mark on the wall or whatever, came back the next week, yeah, wow, it grew. And so we plant plants, we have philodendrons, we have plants, we know that they'll grow. We can't sit and watch them grow and expect to see anything, but they grow. And that's the same type of patience that we need to have with ourselves. This journey is a process. This journey is a learning process. So the last thing I want you to do is to take away from this that, oh, the scriptures say I shouldn't worry about stuff, so oh, now I'm really going to worry that I'm worrying about stuff. No. <laughs> And, and, I, and I know people in the room right now that would take on that challenge, right? <clears throat> but the message this morning is to look at this passage in Philippians and truly take it and truly treat it as a roadmap, as a prescription, and understand that you have a design. Understand that God designed you in a specific way. He knows what you need. He knows what you need, including and factoring in the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. And because all that's true, because we know that we have God's grace, because we know that the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard our hearts and minds, we should relax. We really, really should relax and take this one step at a time. And my final thought this morning, and we've kind of touched on it, is don't let church, don't let your faith be another source of anxiety. Don't let your church and your faith in your journey layer on another set of expectations. That's not what God intended. And if you go through things, and if I get a chance to come back and talk again, we can go through some of these things, but you know, God wants us to fully experience His grace and fully experience trust in Him. And He does that because He loves us. And He does it because He's designed us in a way that He knows that when we're when we've embraced that grace, that we're not inward focused. When we embrace that peace, that we're not incessantly looking and thinking about ourselves, that, that we can turn outward and we can fulfill the ministry that God's given us, that we can reach our God-designed potential in our lives to be there for others. And so it's grace and peace and relaxation that empowers us, that fuels us to embrace the ministry that we have in our lives, whether that's with our families, with people at work, at school, and church, whatever it is. It's not this set of expectations, and I'm trying, I've got all these different constructs and realities in my life, and each of them layers on expectations, no. God gives us this worry-free, anxiety-free imperative for a reason. 
So take that with you this morning. Take that with you this week. Embrace it as a, a new way to think about your spiritual journey. And thank you very much for the time this morning. Let's pray. <clears throat> Our gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day and for this time together in your word. And we love you and thank you for the grace and peace and the opportunity and the freedom to relax that you give us. Thank you for designing us and loving us in a way that, that we know that you can tell us not to worry about anything. Thank you, Father, for all these things in Christ's name.